This conference will now be recorded. Dear brethren, this export was written about in Timaru about 46 years ago, and due to the age of Sasha and Rebecca at the time, we were not able to travel to Christchurch to for me to deliver it. So it was posted to Christchurch and read on my behalf. So in effect, this is the first time I've given it. You will have noticed in the reading from Genesis the trepidation that um, Jacob felt in the meeting up with Esau. And why was that? Well, in Genesis 21 verse 41, we see now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And the preceding verses of Genesis 27 tell us of the incident of the blessing of, of Isaac, of his two sons. <clears throat> and I'm sure we're all very familiar with that incident. The blessing of Jacob above Esau, which seems to be a deception to bring about the fulfillment of that act of cunning of Jacob of earlier time, where he brought the birth, bought the birthright from Esau for a bowl of pottage. Jacob was quick thinking to consider the birthright at such a time. Having a discernment of its true value, he considered this a good moment to endeavour securing it, realising that his brother was not fully aware of its worth. He chose his moment well, a time when Esau did not have the slightest inclination to think about birthrights. So, by his cunning and alert thinking, Jacob purchased to himself this prized possession. It was fine to secure these rights in theory, but when it came to the time of securing these rights of firstborn in practice, would it be as easy to perform as it had been to purchase them in the first place? This, we see, as we see from Genesis 27, would be put to the test. The time had come for Isaac to pass on a blessing to the firstborn before he died. It would appear that Jacob's purchase was going to be of no effect. Isaac had said to Esau, prepare a meal of venison, and then he would bless him. So much for the birthright. Isaac knew that Esau was the firstborn, and he was going to treat him accordingly. However, to secure this right, this blessing, Jacob, moved by his mother Rebekah, brought about a situation whereby he received this blessing, reserved for the firstborn, in the stead of his brother Esau, while his brother was absent. <clears throat> it seems to have been a last-ditch attempt to secure what he considered to be rightfully his. This action had been branded and had been branded in representing Jacob's character and events that were to happen after that seemed to form of punishment for his actions. <clears throat> Was Jacob to be punished for his actions? Was he wrong in doing what he did? Was he bringing about by his own design that which he should have had faith to leave to God? Or were his actions justifiable? Rather than just branding the incident as a punishable act of deception, let us extend the scene with a little depth and consider the situation in a light of deeper study can reveal. From their birth, there was a considerable difference between the two boys. Whether these differences showed to any extent during their boyhood, we do not know. But once they started to develop their manly characteristics, the differences would then become apparent. Esau was, we are told, a cunning hunter, a man of the field. In other words, he was a fun-seeking, pleasure-loving, self-willed, natural individual. Jacob, however, was a plain man dwelling in tents. He was a sober, fearful, righteous worshipper of God. As these characteristics developed, 
the more noticeable would be the difference between them. From our own understanding of the scriptures, we are able to discern which of these characteristics would be more pleasing to God and which the more attractive to man. The natural appealing character of Esau must not be overlooked, for it had its effect on his father. Isaac had favoritism for Esau. He loved him, we are told, because he did eat of his venison. Isaac himself was a quiet, reserved person. Without dispute, to the character of such an one would be the sporting, manly type of Esau find great appeal. This, in fact, caused a blinding, biased favoritism that obviously became quite evident. Isaac was seeing Esau purely from a natural point of view. Had he been looking for spiritual uprightness, he should have seen that Jacob was more deserving of his attentions. The blessing that is before our attention this morning is of necessity correlated and dependent upon the birthright. The birthright, or right of the firstborn, was the entitlement to the prime, to the prime of the inheritance. <clears throat> the first of everything, the right to carry on the family name, the firstborn was heir. Anything special pertaining to the father was the legal right of the firstborn. In the case of Isaac, it was the blessing. The Spirit of God was with Isaac, and any blessing he should bestow would be of effect. He was going to ensure that he passed on this blessing before his death, and so made preparations for this in issuing his command to Esau. We're not aware of the length of time Esau was out hunting, but it was certainly a suitable and sufficient time to take actions to prevent it of him receiving the blessing. Rebecca is often deemed an accomplice, an accessory to the act of, of securing this blessing to Jacob with, against the will and knowledge of his father. Because Isaac was blind, not only his son, but also his wife, were prepared to attempt to fool him. Before branding Rebecca with this felony, have all the facts and points been considered? What were her motives? What were her reasons? We must remember that before the birth of the two children, Rebecca was told by God that they were the beginning of two manner of people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Rebecca kept this in her heart. She knew and understood the implication of what she had been told. She believed and was faithful to God. She knew that the purpose would be fulfilled. Although she did not know how they would come about, she had a true discernment of the things concerning God's will. Because of this, her thinking was not clouded by the natural affections of the flesh. Those things desirable to our fleshly feelings, those things that we like and would have happen. No, her thinking was clear, unbiased. She was able to see a way whereby the purpose of God may be worked out, whereby this prophecy might be fulfilled. Naturally, her actions were stimulated by this clear, unbiased spiritual thinking. She had only God's will in mind. Jacob, we can be sure, appreciated the righteousness of his mother. Because of this, he had always been obedient to her. And now, at this time, he had respect under her decision. What reason did he have to doubt her righteousness now? Rebecca's love for Jacob was spurred on by the knowledge she had that he was the chosen one of God. No righteous woman in such a position could do otherwise, as she did all she could to guide her son to ensure his worthiness to fulfill this purpose. She considered it her duty and laboured at it, not wishing her works or his to, or his to prejudice this revealed fact. We are not told so but it is quite probable that Rebecca was involved in the securing of the birthright to Jacob. It is quite reasonable to assume that she and Jacob talked often about how this promise, this prophecy, might be accomplished. What mother in such a position wouldn't? She would want to prepare her son. She would want him to be ready when the time arose. She would want him to be able to recognise any sign that may be given, equally as much as she would want to recognise it herself. She would not want a situation to be lost through lack of preparation. Her fear of God and her love for Jacob would have given her the perception of the situation, 
right for the obtaining of the birthright from Esau. The time to induce him to part with that which was his legal privilege was at hand. The opportunity was not to be missed. Jacob used it well. Jacob's meal was prepared at the right time. As always, Jacob was ready for the opportunity that was about to present itself. He was well prepared for the situation. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint, and said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, some of that red pottage, for I am faint. His entrance displays that he was ravaged with hunger. Taking the situation in hand, Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. Then Esau scoffed, Here I am weak with hunger, at the point to die, and you want to talk about birthrights? I don't want to talk about birthrights. What good is it going to do me if I die of hunger? However, Jacob persisted, and Esau swore unto him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. All Esau wanted to do was fill his belly. He wanted to satisfy himself now, rather than lay up in store for the future. He had no respect for the birthright at this time. In fact, Esau despised his birthright. For a moment's natural lust, Esau bargained away much gratification for the future. The transfer of the birthright from Esau to Jacob brought the situation more into harmony with God. There was, however, one remaining obstacle. Isaac loved Esau. Esau found favour in his eyes. The natural affections of Isaac were being brought into play rather than spiritual rightness. Isaac, realising his condition, was going to perform that which was his duty. He was going to do it as he foresaw fit. To him, Esau was the older. It was his right in, Esau, in Isaac's eyes, and his love for his son urged him to establish his aim. The director was issued to Esau, who immediately took the command to action. This introduction to which Rebecca was witness, though it was, though it was to satisfy natural likes rather than spiritual necessities, greatly exercised her. She knew that Esau would probably be successful and would obtain that blessing she knew rightly belonged to the younger according to what the Lord had told her. She took upon herself the responsibility of coming between Isaac and the fulfilment of his intentions. Who is to say that she was not divinely stirred to defeat this merely natural partiality of Isaac's? <clears throat> she very quickly and clearly thought out what she would do and informed Jacob of her plan. With no time for delay, she sent Jacob for her requirements. Two good kids from the flock that she may dress them in the manner that his father liked. She was going to try and imitate the flavour of the savoury meat of Esau's. She knew that it would take time, and she hastened to it. The second phase was to prepare Jacob, that to the touch of his father, he would pass as Esau. This also would not be an easy thing, but she had in her mind a way to achieve it. She dressed Jacob in a manner that to his blind father makes him appear his brother. This worked, and Jacob received the blessing which was his by divine purpose. God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone that curses you and blessed be he that blesses you. The Lord had provided the time which was necessary for the completion of the action. It was sufficient for the working out of his purpose and Rebecca's actions were more according to God's will than the intentions of Isaac's were. Therefore, as a consequence, God's will was done. After he was aware that he had blessed Jacob, Isaac trembled exceedingly. He probably realised that which he had almost done. He had, com had completely allowed natural fleshly feelings to override that which he knew to be right in the sight of God. He could so easily have bestowed the blessing on the wrong son had Rebecca not been divinely stirred to divert such a happening. This may not seem very important, but remember 
that we are dealing with men upon whom the Spirit rested. Perhaps to some, these instances are still a little difficult to understand, but this is only so on the basis of having, of having preconceived ideas on the subject of morality. The false philosophy of human speculation assumes morality to be a fixed element in the constitution of things, God being as much subject to it as his creatures. The fact revealed by the scriptures is that there is no such thing as fixed morality at all. Right or wrong is not determinable by, determinable by standards man may set. The only right or wrong is determinable in the things appointed by our eternal creator. It is therefore quite simply established by what he has commanded. He is the, denom he is the dominator of the situations. It is only right if he states it to be so. For example, we know it is not right to kill because he has said, thou shalt not kill. However, there have been times he, that is God, has specifically commanded to kill. At such a time, it would not only be sin not to kill, but would be righteousness to do so. It is like that with all things. If God has commanded, it is his will, his purpose, and it is righteousness to perform. Man's ideas or notions mean not a thing if they do not coincide with the will of God. This simple principle removes any difficulty that human philosophy has created and enables us to establish right. In the events before us, we have an allegory. The elder shall serve the younger. Adam, the old man, shall be under dominion of Christ the younger. The old man will have to come into subjection. In respect of the two characters involved, one was suitable for the establishment of the, of the covenant, and the other was not. God makes a choice of those who are suitable to his purpose, those whose credentials measure up to the divine requirements. God knew that Jacob was more suitable to the work and responsibility of the election. God in his infinite wisdom knows the work that has to be done. He knows the difficulties involved in doing it. He knows and selects the persons with the necessary qualities. The characters of both Esau and Jacob consolidate the allegory. Esau being a type of the old man, the natural, Jacob a type of the new man, the spiritual, Christ. We are born as of Adam, the old, the natural. If we are found to have the qualities suitable for his work, we are chosen by God. By our obedience to our call and by God's grace, we may transform and become as the new, Christ. We leave the natural behind entirely and adhere only to the spiritual. <clears throat> it is no easy thing to obtain the birthright. It is not offered to all or ta to take or leave as they please. Neither is it, is it a thing to be taken lightly, something that will be ours some day. No. It must be considered, regarded. Its importance, its value, must be realized and cherished. What was Esau's downfall? His disregard for its value. His neglect for the things that could have, have consolidated it as his possession. God, nor the things pertaining to him, will not be lightly esteemed. Wants and likes of the moment are quite common. It is not unusual to have desires for things, and they may even seem important enough at the time, perhaps even necessary. For the want of a moment, a lust, natural feelings, Esau gambled away a great prize and possession. For a morsel of food, he sold himself into bondage. Are we going to sell ourselves into bondage? We have been called to be of the mighty, given the opportunity to be of those who will be dominant. We have been offered something glorious, something immeasurably wonderful, something irreplaceable. We have to decide what we are doing with it. Are we going to accept it, to cherish it, guard it, treat it as our prized possession, give it a rank above all else, Make its protection our every present duty? 
Or will we sell it for a plate of pottage? Will we let it go in a moment of natural weakness, in a time when other worldly things are very attractive, when thoughts of us by other people are considered, when we can't be bothered worrying about it, when its value in our eyes has dropped to rock bottom? It may be fine to content ourselves, we guard our possession most of the time. Most of the time? If we want to keep it, we guard it all the time. When does a thief sneak in and steal our goods? In the daylight, when we are at home watching them? No, in the night, when we were out, when we have forgotten about them for the time being. When we discover what has happened, what do we feel? If only I had done this or that. Yes, if only. Esau, when he discovered that Jacob had received the blessing, then realized the importance of it. But it was too late. It had been given. When at the judgment we find our blessing has been taken by another, we also will be too late. We will fully realize its value then, but what good will that will be our thoughts? I guarded it most of the time. If only I had done such and such. Remember, Christ said, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Esau, when he heard that Jacob had been blessed, cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. Esau lifted up his voice and wept. With much tears, Esau endeavoured to purchase that which he had lost, but it was to no avail. It was too late. There was no prize for the second place, for the almost good enough, and there will be no prize in the day of judgment for second place. To receive the blessing as Jacob, we must be spiritually minded always. Our calling is in Christ our Saviour, he who was so perfectly obedient to his Father's will for our sake. We are here this morning to remember him, not by mechanically partaking of the emblems, that is no remembrance, but by the refreshing ourselves of his actions, that we may mirror him. If we are to be with him in the kingdom, we must be with him now. There is only one way to do that, and he plainly tells us. We can only be his if we do his commandments. We know the race we are running. We know the end prize. Let us fully appreciate Jesus' words of Revelation 3.11. Hold that fast which you have, that no man take your crown.